Uh, my name is CJ, and uh, I'm so excited that you're here. And we at, at the Short Church believe that there's four things that God wants to do in your life. He, of course, He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you, so He wants uh, for you to know God, right? And and the second thing He wants to do in your life is He wants you to help you find freedom. Like all of us need freedom in some area of our life, and so He wants to walk you through that freedom. And we, as a church, want to help you do that. All of you are made with a purpose. And so we uh, help you find that purpose here at the Short Church, and all of us are made to make a difference. There's four things that God wants for you. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And we're going to do that today uh, here as we've been worshiping Him, we're finding freedom in Him, we're getting to know Him. And as we open up God's Word, we're going to get to know Him a little bit more this morning. And uh, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to step into week number two of our series called Wonder. And uh, this, this series, Wonder, is about the sort of like the wonder of what's going on in this season, right? The, the, a lot of times we kind of get distracted, but the, the Christmas is a wonderful season. Sometimes we, we, we get uh, overwhelmed by the, the pace of life, the shopping, the, the commercials, the commercialism, you know, like all these things. Uh, we we kind of get in this routine that it's like, okay, it's just another season, another thing. But when we stop and we kind of cancel all of that, there's this wonderful moment that happened at the beginning of, of the Gospels uh, about Jesus, and it's his birth. And when we look at that nativity scene, sometimes we just kind of flash by it uh, this time of year where it's in somebody's lawn or it's a, on some kind of side table at your house. We just kind of flash by it. But, but when we really stop and think about this moment, it's truly a moment of absolute wonder, a, a, a moment that makes us go, whoa, a moment that makes us go, Wow. And so today what I want to do is I want to look at this moment of wonder and I want to look at the events that kind of happen immediately after Jesus' birth. But before we do that, I want to show you the definition of the word wonder. All right, check it out. Uh, wonder is a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration. So that, that word surprise, I'm going, whoa, like, like, like that's the emotion that I kind of feel. I'm like, whoa, I'm surprised. Anybody ever, do you guys get what I'm saying? Okay, whoa, all right, you guys are, okay, the coffee's not as strong as my, whatever, okay, all right, I get it, I get it, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to work for it this morning, that's okay. Uh, the feeling of surprise mingled with admiration, wow, like, wow, like, whoa, wow, you guys kind of get the emotion here? Have you ever had the moments that make you go, whoa, wow, anybody? Yeah, yeah, th that's, that's a moment of wonder. Thanks for participating here this morning. Is my mic off still? I'm just kidding. That's funny. It's funny to me, at least. All right. But look at, look at how the definition continues. Caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. And all of these words, to me, describe this scene that we see in the New Testament of Jesus being born. It's a moment of, whoa, God would become a man? Wow. That's kind of cool that he would do that for me. Does that make sense? This is, this is something that is a, a holy, holy, holy moment. And this is the wonder of Christmas. In this time of year, we, we try to fit a lot of things in. There's always something going on. The schedules get busier. And sometimes we miss this wonder. So for, throughout this month of December, I want to I do this series called Wonder so that no matter what happens between Monday and Saturday, you can have a moment of wonder just to wonder at the, the miracle that is the birth of Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do this series. And, and so today what I'm going to do is look at Matthew chapter 2. And uh, it's the events happening right after Jesus' birth. And uh, it's, it's with the wise men. So I'm going to read the entire story. And then we're going to go through the story kind of a little bit more line by line as we go throughout the day. All right? So let me read it as in its entirety so we kind of get the scene. All right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, because, well, he's the king, and there's a new king, right? And, and as everyone in Jerusalem. And he, and he called a meeting with the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said. Okay. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when, I find, and when you find him, come back to me and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. 
After this interview, the wise men went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy, and they entered the house, and they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed, and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, no, no, okay, Okay, when it was time to leave, they returned home to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So you guys get the, the big picture on this, right? So these guys, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're astrologers uh, in, in eastern lands, east of Israel. And they see this new star appear, and they come to the city of uh, Jerusalem, and Herod the king is there, and they're like, okay, where's the king? And he's going, I'm the king. <laughs> what do you mean, where's the king? And he's greatly disturbed, and they're like, no, 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 the new king which, of course, bothers the old king, am I right? Right? Like, okay. So if you were the king, that would bother you too, probably. And so he goes, okay, so when did the star appear? And they tell him how long ago it was, and he goes, great, go find this king, and then tell me where he is so I can go worship him. He's not going to worship him, is he? No, he wants to take him out, right? And so uh, we read through the story. They find the king, the, the, these wise men find Jesus born uh, in these, he's in Bethlehem still. And then they're warned in a dream not to go back the way that they came, not to go back to Herod, because Herod didn't have the intent to worship Jesus, but the intent to kill Jesus. And so the wise men leave, and they go back a different way. Now, throughout this story, I mean, I know it's kind of a little bit longer to read together, but throughout this story, there's four things I want to pull out of it that give us an actual, like, look at the Christmas story that have these moments of wonder. And I think there's four things that we can do that can lead us to this destination of wonder as well. Y'all ready for this? All right. Number one, they saw God among the ordinary. Now, these guys were not necessarily um, Jewish. They, actually, they probably weren't Jewish at all. They were probably astrologers living in eastern lands, and they were, they were trying to find God in the stars. They were trying to find their futures. They were trying to find their hope in the stars, and they were astrologers, which would be strictly forbidden in uh, Jewish uh, nature or in the Jewish culture, right? And so these guys, they were looking at the stars. They saw something new, a new star, and they said, okay, this must be the star that points us to God. Isn't it interesting? Even though Matthew's the one recording all this, the star wouldn't have been important to him, but he wrote it anyway because the star was important to somebody else. Like, the star wasn't important to the Jewish people. They probably wouldn't have even noticed the star, this new star, except for these people were astrologers looking at the stars. They weren't godly, but they were looking for God. They were looking at the stars trying to find something, and God speaks their language. I don't know about you. There's been times in my life where I was like, you know what, God, I don't really want to do something for you right now, but in the midst of all the things that I was doing for me, God spoke anyway. God spoke in the midst of their trying to search and find something for themselves. He goes, I'm going to speak your language because that's the only way you're going to hear me. That God steps out of the Jewish culture into an entirely different culture so that they can see God among the ordinary. The Jewish people didn't even notice because it's just the stars. Just stars. That's all. But God is among the ordinary. And he speaks a new language to these people that they can understand so they can find Jesus. And throughout our life, we're, great, we're, we're kind of faced with the same things. Look at the verse. Uh, let me give you the verse. They came up. They showed up in Jerusalem. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star. We saw his star. See, I think this time of year, we can run so fast that we can miss the, everything seems so ordinary. We can miss the voice of God in these little ways. All of Israel, there was a star above them that pointed the way to Jesus, but it was people that were far from God were the only ones that saw it. Think about that for a minute. In our lives, are we going to let the pace of life and the routine of life and the rut of life distract us from the wonder of Christmas? These wise men, they were looking for God among the ordinary. And I think that's where God speaks most often. In my life, as I've gone throughout my, my uh, upbringing and in church and everything, more often God speaks through the ordinary than he does the extraordinary. 
It's not the huge burning bush moments like Moses at the burning bush. It, it's not those types of moments that God speaks to me. It's in the quiet, still moments where I just go, okay, I'm going to have a moment of peace. I'm going to look for you, God, in the midst of all of the ordinary around me. That's where I get to hear from him. And that's where the wise men were. They were doing what they did, and they took the time to recognize God even in the ordinary things. The second thing I think we can learn from these wise men is uh, that their hearts were ready to worship. I don't know about you, sometimes my life, I go through life ready to worship me more so than God. Anybody else? One person, thank you. I, sometimes I go through life ready to go, okay, what does TJ want today? What do I want to do? What can I eat? What can I go have fun with? What kind of, what can, can people treat me nicely? Is everybody going to get out of my way in traffic, right? Like, like what's TJ want today? But their attitude was a little different than mine, right? They, they looked a little different. They had a little different take on life because when they were looking for God among the ordinary, they were actually set to worship this God. Look what it says, Matthew chapter 2. We saw his star, and we have come for one purpose. There's one reason we traversed the, the, the deserts and the mountain ranges. There's one reason why I showed up here. It's because I want to worship him. Can you imagine what that was like? The journey was great. The distance was long. There were thieves and robbers and the elements, the rain, the, the, the heat of the desert, all of that working against them, but they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed for one purpose, just to worship Jesus. I got in a car that had like heat and air conditioning and drove over here and sit in a comfy seat, right? And we're like, God, what can you do for me? Right? Doesn't that kind of convict you just a little bit? That these guys, they, they, the reason that they came to across all of this was for the sole purpose of go, you're worthy. I'm going to lift you up. I love that. These guys got a moment of wonder. They got to see Jesus, the king, not because they came to get something, but because they came to worship. I love that. And I think when we come to worship, we actually get to receive something from God. And it's not about the receiving, though. It's about the giving. Their attitude was right. Their heart was right. And he is so worthy of our worship, isn't he? When we look at the, the, the cross and we look at the resurrection, when we look at it all, it all started in this little moment right here. And when we worship him in this way, we get to see the king of kings. We get to see the Lord of Lords. We get to see the light in the darkness. We get the one that opens the eyes of the blind. We get the one that conquers hell, death, and the grave. We get to see that alive inside of us when we come to worship, not just receive. And that's what these wise men did. And I absolutely love this part of the story. I was reading two weeks ago uh, in the book of Psalms, and I was reading the message translation um, which is kind of a looser translation, but it, it kind of puts a little bit more emotion into the, the, the text and the verbiage. So I want to read you Psalms chapter 22 this morning in regards to this worship. And then I want to put some, some things contextually in order for you guys, okay? Psalms 22 says this, uh, from the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses. Uh, they're running back to God. So, so, the psalmist, his name's David, he was King David, long before, a thousand years before Jesus was ever born, is writing about a moment where people are going to travel from a far distance to come back to God. Lost, long lost families are falling on their faces before him. God has taken charge. From now on, he has the last word. So there's, there's this distance between God and people. But he says there's going to be a day where they're going to come to their senses and they're going to come back and they're going to fall on their face before him. They're going to worship him. These, these wise men, they were distant. They were a long way away, but they came for one purpose. And what was that purpose? To worship. Just to lay down. Just to, just to go, God, wow, whoa, wow, whoa. The verse continues. All the power mongers are before him worshiping. All the people that want to be in power, all the, the, the go-getters and the politicians, and they're like, they're coming to their senses, they're going, ooh, I'm going to worship. All the poor and powerless too, 
worshiping along with those who never got it together. I'm in that camp. How about you guys? Worshiping. Just all these people coming to their senses going, oh my gosh, look at this moment of wonder. Whoa, wow. And it doesn't stop there. Our children and their children will get on in this word, pass along from parent to child. Babies yet conceived will hear the good news that God does what he says. It's this moment of just praise and worship to God, and he's saying people are going to come, and they're going to come from the four corners. Lost family members from the tribe of God will come back to him, and they're going to go, wow, whoa, wow, everybody. doesn't matter if they're the powerful or the people who don't have it together. Whoa, wow, worshiping. Now, I find this passage interesting because it was written before the birth of Jesus. There's a passage in the book of Isaiah as well that describes Jesus' life in incredible detail in the 53rd chapter of, of Isaiah. But this was even written before that chapter. Like, if you think about it, the way these, these passages are written, Jesus should be born, on the cross died, Isaiah should write about it, and then Psalms should celebrate it, right? But in the Bible, it's actually in chronological order. It's, it's celebrated, it's predicted in the book of Isaiah, and then we get to get the final picture of it when Jesus actually comes to earth, the wonder of it all. David's celebrating these moments long before it ever happened. And even to this day, there's people coming from across the world to their senses going, whoa, wow, let's worship him. These are beautiful moments, aren't they? Just so cool. And I love this last line, that God does what he says. He says, I'm going to send my son. He says, I'm going to pay the price of sin. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to be a light in the darkness. I'm going to bring healing to the sick and the broken and the poor. I'm going to do that. And he does what he says. And these wise men, when they came to Jesus, the one thing, the one thing that they came to do was to worship. We've, we saw the star and we came to worship. That's it. That's the only thing. Third thing that we can learn from this is that they, um, they enjoyed the journey. I'm not a journey person. How about you guys? Like there's destination people and there's journey people. I'm a destination person. Anybody else? You're like, get her done. Like the scenic way is not my way, the way that I want to, like that's not the way. There is a, 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 there's a reason why we said we're going to show up at this time. It's because we're going to show up at that time, right? Like I'm an on-time kind of person. Anybody else? man, where are my on-time people? Like, I thought the first service would be full of these people. I thought first service would be like, mm, I'm ready. I'm ready to rock and roll. We're done with, the, we're like, we like worship God. We're, now we have the rest of the day ready to go. No, anybody? Like, I'm, that's me, man. That's me. I'm all the way. I'm on-time kind of person. But then there's this journey part that I'm not so comfortable with. There's, there's detours and there's roadblocks and but when I get in my mode of let's go, let's get it done, let's get back, something I miss something in the journey. I've begun to I've begun to learn that. Doesn't mean I'm good at it, but I've begun to learn something. In the journey, there's lessons. In the journey, there's moments of wonder that if I could slow down just enough, I might pick up moments of wonder that I never saw before. And in this time of year, you got to enjoy the journey of what's happening. you got to slow down and pick up the moments of family, the moments of relationship, the moments where God speaks in the ordinary, and we may miss it because we're not enjoying the journey. Look at them in, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. Now, let me tell you why this is uh, kind of an incredible moment. They were in the east and they headed towards the west following the star. Now they're in Jerusalem and the star's gone. So they asked the question, where's Jesus? And Herod's like, whoa, 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 that whole thing happens. And then the star reappears and it leads them to Bethlehem, which is no longer taking them west. It's actually taking them south. And it went ahead of them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They're filled with joy. 
See, when they were following the star, they were filled with joy. The star went away, and they were just like, huh? But they didn't quit searching. They kept the journey going. They kept asking the right questions. They kept pressing in. You ever feel like you run into a dead end in life sometimes? They just kept going. Whenever I find myself at a dead end, I usually want to quit. How about you guys? But these guys, they kept pushing. They kept pressing on. They found themselves at a dead end. And they go, you know what? We're going to keep asking the question. And when the star reappears, ooh, I'm going to enjoy the journey. And they go to the place where Jesus was. They kept pressing in. Listen, when it comes to the journey of life, you will get out of it what you expect. If you expect nothing, you're probably going to get nothing. But when your eyes are opened to the joy of the journey, you're going to see something. Because when they started looking for the star, it led them to the sun. Not S-U-N-S-O-N. The son of God. Okay, sorry, that was a bad phrase. Well, it's a good one now, right? Okay. When they saw the star, it led them to the sun. And when the star disappeared, they could have given up. But they kept asking, they kept pressing. And then the star reappeared and led them to Jesus. In my life, I've had times where I wanted to give up where I was broken, when I didn't have what it took. But I kept pressing. I think God wants you to keep pressing this morning. Keep finding those moments of wonder in the mundane, in the ordinary. Keep letting God push, press, find. All right? That's what these guys did. They were filled with joy along the journey. And then number four, the fourth thing that they did, is they worshiped with more than words. They worshiped with just more, more than words. Like, you and I, we're good at worshiping with words. I think that. Like, we have a great worship atmosphere here at the Shore Church. We got some great vocalists, some band members. We, we love to sing. We love to worship. We love to raise our hands. But these guys, they're like, you know what? We want to worship him, but we want to worship with more than just our words. There's, there's more worship to be given than just the words that we have. Look at it in Matthew chapter 2. They entered the house, and they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him. They're, they're They're using their body to worship, but they're also using their words to worship. Then they opened their treasure chest and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They gave him these gifts. Why? Because they were still continuing to worship him in this moment of wonder. They were ready to worship him, not just with their words, but with their life. And can you imagine the preparation that it took to worship him in this way? They couldn't just go, okay, uh, Jesus, we finally found him. Let's get the gifts. No, they'd been traveling for months. They had to prepare months in advance to get these gifts together so they can worship this Jesus in this way. Does that make sense? They see the star and they go, okay, we want to worship him. But before we leave our homes, we got to go get our gold. We got to pack it in. Before we go on this journey, I've got to get the frankincense in the myrrh, and I got to load it on the camel, because I don't know when I'm going to see him. I just know that I'm going to go try and find him. I'm going to go after him. And they begin to prepare themselves to live this life of worship. They didn't know if they were going to find him, but they were ready to worship when they did. And not just with their words, because sometimes words can be cheap, right? They decided, you know what, we're going to worship him with our life, with everything we are. And there's some wonderful significance to these gifts, the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gift of gold would be the gift for a king. In this time frame in ancient history, if you visited a king from a foreign land, you would bring a gift with you, kind of a, a goodwill offering that they would treat you well when you arrive. And so when they saw King Herod, they didn't open up the gold because he wasn't the king they were looking for. When they found Jesus, they say, this is the king. And they give the gift of royalty. And the next gift, the gift of uh, frankincense, is, it's, a, it's an aromatic resin. It's, it's, it's incense. It would be used in the worship of God. It would be a, a holy gift, a priestly gift. They were recognizing not just the kingship in the gold, but the divinity of Jesus in the frankincense. They say, this is not just an ordinary child. This is royal. This is holy. 
Then the third one is the myrrh. Myrrh is, uh, is uh, again, it's a fragrance. It's, a, it's like a perfume. And you would prepare someone's body for burial with the myrrh. So Jesus is royal with the gold. He is divine with the frankincense. And he's going to die. Sacrifice for you and I. That's the myrrh. These are the gifts they gave him. This is the way they worshipped him. They worshipped him as king. They worshipped him as divine. They worshipped him as the sacrifice. I love that. And I want my life to do the same thing for him. How about you? I would love to see my life given as a gift in this way. That the, Everything I have given in a gift in this way. But you know what the most incredible gift is this time of year? Isn't the gifts that we give him but it's the fact that he gave first. It's the fact that he came to earth to begin with. Not just to be born and rule, but to be born and die for us. It's the greatest gift we could ever have. So this morning, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take a moment where we can just be kind of quiet and ask God, God, can we have a moment of wonder with you? So if you could, could you close your eyes, bow your heads with me this morning? If you're here today and you say, you know what, the season's kind of been getting to me, I kind of lost sight of the wonder of it all, that Jesus is king, that Jesus is divine, that Jesus died for me. Would you take a moment now and just go, God, can, can you begin to show me this wonder, the wonder of what's going on, the wonder of Jesus? Or maybe you're here today and it's your first time in church, maybe first time in a really long time and you don't really understand the, why, why this birth is so important. We well, see Jesus was born so that he could be a sacrifice for our sins. See, our sins separated us from God, but that that wasn't good enough for God to be separated from his people. Someone needed to pay the price to close the gap between us and God. Sin always separates. But Jesus paid the price with his own life so that we could have salvation in him. So today, if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, today is your day to do that. Would you take a moment now with me? Close your eyes, bow your heads, focus in on what God's doing. I think a moment of wonder is going to occur when you say yes to him. And you can pray a prayer like this, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for giving yourself for me. Thank you for the hope that you've given me. Thank you for the joy that you've given me because of the sacrifice on the cross. So today, God, I give you everything I am. Use me. Lead me. Guide me. I'm yours. Make me new in you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Everybody says, Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you prayed that prayer with us, we would like to help you on your spiritual journey. If you don't mind going to theshorechurch.com or emailing us at hello at theshorechurch.com, we can send you some information to start this spiritual journey of faith. And of course, we'd always love to see you in person at The Shore Church, 3375 Fruitville Road.